Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for inviting me, uh, especially Dr. Josh Suja and Dr. Sagar. I think uh, it had been a very interesting uh, trip for me. Uh, this is the first time I've been to India, and I really enjoyed the hospitality. So uh, I switched the order of my talk uh, so that we can uh, talk about the fistula before the endovascular placement of AV graph. Um, so we heard a lot about brachial basic fistula. And uh, I'm a vascular surgeon with a lot of interest in vascular access. So I do about 200 to 300 cases a year. And uh, I thought I had pretty high volume uh, of uh, surgical experience access. But coming here, when I talked to uh, some of the physicians here, including uh, Dr. Ba Bala during lunchtime, and uh, he was telling me that they have done more than a thousand fistula. So it had been a very humbling experience for me. Uh, but anyhow, so I thought I'll approach this a little bit differently. I'll talk about evidence-based uh, uh, outcomes for brachial basilic fistula. A lot of work are based on a couple of papers and a review that I did a couple of years ago. So brachial basilic fistula is first described by Dacker in 76. So uh, he's the first one that uh, uh, described this. And uh, during that time, it, it was a single stage brachial basilic fistula with transposition. So when you look at basilic vein, uh, it's a relatively deep vein. So you know, there's no question the first option should be cephalic vein, either radiocephalic or brachiocephalic. When we exhausted that option, the next thing that we look at is uh, either AV graft versus uh, basilic vein. So when we look at basilic vein, it's deep, uh, it's relatively preserved from IV line insertion or blood draw. Having said that, a lot of patients in the US had a pig line inserted into the uh, basilic vein. So in our hospital, when patient is uh, either CKD end stage, uh, we told them not to do it. In fact, it's contraindicated. They have to talk to either the nephrologist or vascular surgeon before they do it. That's to try to preserve the future use of basilic vein. And uh, it is relatively larger in diameter and thicker wall. So uh, there's a lot of potential for that to become a good fistula. Having said that, the role of brachial basilic fistula in most access surgeon uh, the treatment algorithm has been inconsistent and unclear. And I'll come back to this a little bit uh, in more, more detail in the next couple of slides. And a couple of things that uh, is not obvious in uh, literature, one is uh, whether we do it one stage versus two stage. It's unclear which one's better. Uh, what type of technique is used for superficialization versus elevation and whether we can do this with open surgery or, and, or minimally invasive uh, approach. I'll cover those a little bit uh, down during my talk. So in the first Kadoki guideline in 97, the first two fistula that we should do is radiocephalic and brachiocephalic. However, when you look at the... Is that point there? Can you just arrange for a pointer, please? Oh, there you go. So, the first two fistula is uh, radiocephalic, brachiocephalic. However, after that, the first recommendation is actually graph when you look at the initial guideline in 97. So, that's kind of interesting. We put graph in front of the basilic vein transposition. During that time, the predominant form of access in US and North America is AV graph, followed by fistula and catheter. So this is the up, oops. So this is the update that was provided in 2006. And, uh, okay. Sorry about that. So uh, this is the, the update. Now they change it. So the first two fistula is radiocephalic and brachiocephalic. Then basilic vein transposition. I think that's more consistent with what we usually do. I think the initial recommendation was provided because number one, transposed fistula is more complex and complicated. And there are question whether the outcome is comparable 
to a simple fistula or graft. However, in the most recent guideline and recommendation in 2006, the brachial basilic fistula is the third fistula that we should do. This is a guideline from Society of Vascular Surgery. A similar recommendation. So you, we approach that the access uh, from distal to proximal. So we try to do radiocephalic versus brachiocephalic, followed by transpose fistula, either basilic or cephalic. So a good ex uh, history and exam is important to uh, before the surgery, and uh, we do ultrasound routinely now. There's a lot of data that suggests routine ultrasound, especially in American population, has better patency and we can increase uh, the, we can get more fistula compared to graft. So pretty, pretty much standard, most people do ultrasound before the surgery. The, the criteria that I use is 2.5 to 3 for vein with a tonicate and about 2 if no tonicate was used. The arterial diameter has more than 2. And one thing that's important to know is uh, whether there's high takeoff of the radial artery or if the basilic vein is short, and then we have mobilized the X-ray uh, vein. Um, I do this with regional block, so the supraclavicular block, but there are people that do it local in general. One stage versus two stage surgery. There's no clear evidence suggesting which one's better, and I'll talk a little bit about it later. So it depends on surgeon preference. Most people do one stage, but there are some that do two stage. Basilic vein typical bifurcate at the elbow, so you, you follow the bigger branch down below the elbow to get the length as long as possible. We try to protect the medium cutaneous nerve. This is a sensory nerve. If there's injury, patient complain of numbness around the medial arm. Despite long incision, Interestingly, most patients come in complaining of numbness around the elbow and below the elbow and not the long incision. I try to mobilize the vein up to X-ray vein as much as possible to avoid tension in the axilla. And uh, some people do transpose and some people do tr uh, superficialization. So I, uh, most people do intra ultrasound. So I use it to mark out the vein, the artery, the branches, and where the transition into the X-ray vein to facilitate, uh, facilitate dissection. So same patient, I do the vein first usually. I try to preserve the nerve, as you can see on the pictures. I try to mobilize as high as possible into the axilla. I divide the vein before I do the arterial exploration. Based on the length of vein, I'll decide where the artery will be used for arterial anastomosis. I typically transpose them, so I do a counter incision and I tunnel the vein into the arterial site and do the anastomosis. I like to keep the axillary vein, the basilic vein, the transition uh, relatively tension free, so I don't hesitate whether we need to divide the axillary vein to get up higher, so I do that uh, almost routinely. And I do the anastomosis. So this is a post op. As you can see, I do a counter incision and then uh, I tunnel it below the skin. Now, some, for two stage, so people do the anastomosis at or below the elbow, wait for four to six weeks for maturation and come back to do the superficialization or transposition. As you can see it here, we did a flap and then we uh, kind of uh, superficialized the, the, the vein and then we try to preserve the, the nerve. That's a paper from, uh, I think this is from Ireland, that they split the nerve to get more length for the vein during their elevation and uh, they don't have any permanent neurological deficit. So that's uh, another technique that you can use. And some people do forearm basilic vein transposition with, uh, they do it either, they transpose it either to radio or they do a loop up to the brachial artery. I usually admit them overnight. The reason is uh, the complication is higher after this fistula compared to simple fistula. And I think that's a lot to do with the BMI and the anatomy and, uh, of the American population. And in fact, that's pretty routine. Most people admit them after transposition for observation. I wait for six to eight weeks if one stage. 
or, or uh, two weeks after the second stage. And I might or might not use ultrasound to evaluate the flow or to mark the vein out for access. So uh, continue the same team uh, as Dr. Sachdeva. So this is our center. And you can see it's a very nice uh, picture uh, in the summer of our hospital. The picture is taken from the parking lot. So this is a paper that I did uh, five years ago. Uh, we looked at all the series with more than 20 patients with single-stage basilic vein transposition from 1978 to 2010. So the, you know, I know I heard a lot about, about the outcome last, uh, yesterday and looking at the poster, but based on the result from Europe and North America, the maturation rate, rate is actually 60 plus to 90. So not as high as here. One year primary patency varies between 50 to 90 percent, mostly in the 70 to 80 percent for this uh, fistula. I think for brachial, cephalic, and radial cephalic, we are talking about 80 to 90 percent. But transposition, majority is in the 70 percent. And secondary patency between 50 to 90 percent, mostly in the 80 percent. So this is a paper that we did a few years ago. So the question is whether transpose cephalic vein fistula and transpose basilic vein fistula is comparable. The reason for doing this is because usually basilic vein is larger than cephalic. Despite that, there are more mobilization and uh, um, dissection required for basilic vein transposition. And usually cephalic vein transposition is done as two-stage procedure. And you can see the patency is very comparable. The primary and secondary patency is very compar comparable between the two procedures. So this is uh, beside the story. But uh, nowadays, we don't really do the cephalic vein transposition or in my practice. What we do is we actually put a guide in to cephalic vein. So that's the picture that we put in the surgery. And uh, that is used to help the technician access the fistula. We don't do it in basilic vein because of the location of the vein. It's hard to access uh, those basilic vein fistula with B-wing because the arm is usually tough to get with the position of dialysis. So this is a paper that I did during uh, my fellowship. At that time, there's a lot of question about whether we should do AV graft versus basilic vein transposition. So we summarized our result and published it in JBS. Uh, yeah, JBS. So we look at about 170 transposed fistula versus about 150 AV graft. These, the, the patient with AV graft are selected to match the, a, the transposed AV fistula. So we, we select people with same, similar age, similar diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and compare them. And you can see, pretty obvious, after a year or two, the patency of the graft dropped down to 30%. This is very comparable to the national result. If you look at the DAC study, which is the largest AV graft study in America, looking at either forearm or upper arm AV graft, the patency is about 30% primary at one year, and maybe 40% secondary patency at one year. So that's very comparable. And you can see brachial basilic fistula is a lot better than AV graft. This is a review that we did which uh, pretty much show the same thing. The patency infection complication is a lot better when we do brachial basilic fistula. Now, talking about single-stage versus two-stage basilic vein transmission, there are a number of studies, about eight here, that look at those technique, and this is one of the meta-analysis in JVS, and there's another one in uh, European studies we show that the maturation rate, primary patency, secondary patency are comparable between two stages. So if you ask the surgeon, people that do one stage, do one stage, people that do two stage, actually continue to perform two stage basilic vein transposition. A figure from the STEM study that show maturation, primary patency, and secondary patency are very similar between two approach. So I primarily do one stage, if possible, there are some patients that I do two-stage. Those that I think the vein is borderline, those that I think the artery is borderline, those people with 
high BMI that I think they have high risk of uh, wound complication, I'll do two stage. And when they are mature, I'll come back and do the superficialization. So this is a picture taken from our car park of the medical school. So as you can see, Shreveport is actually a very, very beautiful city. And although we don't see this very often, but uh, sometimes that happens in the summer. There are a couple of papers that talk about minimally invasive technique. So what they do is they do skip incision or they do keyhole endoscopic harvest. They're small series. The rationale of doing it is whether they have less wound complication <coughs> but have similar patency. I think these are small series. Uh, most people don't do it, but people that do it routinely are the people that do it for endoscopic harvest or bypass or cabbage and they, do it, they use the same technique for uh, basal vein transposition. Arm edema is common after brachial basilic fistula. It's reported to about eight, uh, 20%. Some people are mild, but for severe one, can be pretty hard to manage. This is likely due to more surgical dissection as well as lymph edema. Usually they are responsive to arm, arm elevation and compression. And if they are persistent for more than six weeks and not getting better, usually I refer them to uh, get a venogram to look for outflow or central stenosis. Wound infection and post-op bleeding and hematoma is uh, higher for transposed fistula when compared to simple fistula. Swing side stenosis is a kind of a most common place for stenosis for these transposed fistula. Uh, typically, I refer them to Dr. Sachdeva or Dr. Abio for venogram or angioplasty. Sometimes I have to take them back for, to do a revision and patch the area. This is a patient who had recurrent stenosis despite angioplasty and I take them back for surgical revision. So in conclusion, <coughs> brachial basilic fistula is excellent uh, access option. It comes after the cephalic and radio, uh, radiocephalic and brachiocephalic fistula. I think it should come before the AV graft. Some people do forearm AV graft before transposed fistula if the basilic vein is borderline in hope that we can do a secondary fistula to get a higher fistula rate. And there's no question the outcome is better for transposed fistula compared to AV graft in terms of patency, reintervention re rate, and infection complication. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. We'll have the next five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Uh, we have a uh, few questions. Uh, one is uh, because the dissection is too difficult and the vein, this basic vein is too deep. It requires much deeper and, and the usable vein is not usually satisfactory even when, when we have a good fistula. Uh, do you, uh, have you tried this uh, ulnar vein mobilization and making a U loop in the forearm? Because we have been making that, that fistula also. So for, so I concentrate on uh, upper arm brachial basilic. Yes. Uh, for forearm basilic, yes. uh, usually you can't use it uh, before transposition. So there are people that do it, transpose them to radial artery or they do a loop, like what you described. Yes. I think it's very well described and their patency is very reasonable. So there are people that do that too. Yes. And another thing is, uh, when you do uh, two-stage surgery, uh, how much is the gap between the second stage? Because we find that when we start, uh, when we, uh, we have tried two stage, due to maturation of the smaller veins, it becomes a lot of uh, bleeding at the time of surgery. So the most paper wait about six weeks before six. they do the second stage. I do about four to six weeks depending on the patient. The, bill, the bleeding issue, uh, I think the mobilization is generally easier because the vein is bigger. Uh, I usually do one stage. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, sometimes I do two stage because either the vein is borderline or the artery is borderline or the patient has high BMI that they, I think they have wound complications so I don't make sure that the vein mature before I go in and do second stage. But there's no direct data suggest which one's better. We, we always prefer one stage. In fact. One stage? Yes. Yeah. 
Actually, we have seen that when we used to convert AV shunt into AV fistula and your veins are matured and the small twigs, they are also quite mature and there is lot of bleeding during dissection. So that is what I think Dr. Bhala was conveying to you. So always it will be better to have a one-stage procedure. How, how, sorry. Go, go ahead. How does this um, compare with the other autogenous vascular axis? I mean, if you can use the saphenous vein graft and use it uh, for the, as an autogenous vascular axis. So the question is whether uh, we can use other vein, right? I think uh, in general, greater saphenous vein is used, but their maturation is not, not that good. So people typically don't use saphenous, but we do brachial vein, we do femoral vein. So we'll you know, get the deep femoral vein and transpose up to upper arm if the artery is reasonable. And those patencies are, are very comparable. There are a couple of small series of saphenous vein, but usually they are not that good. The, I think a lot of time the saphenous vein doesn't dilate uh, enough, uh, but there are some series that describe good outcomes too. Just one clarification regarding the cardiac failure rate and limb ischemia rate because of the large artery and a large vein that you're taking here now. Compared, the basic vein is a large vein. So the, will that worsen the cardiac status? We just heard in the previous lecture about the complications of the heart and ischemia to the limb distally. Have you had any such complications? So the, the, so I'll answer the second question first. The limb ischemia, the steel syndrome is higher for brachial artery based special. The reason is because brachial artery is bigger and they are, you know, if you have steel on the radio, usually I'll not compensate. So typically people report a higher rate of steel uh, for brachial artery, but not necessarily for transpose. And I don't think, I don't think that I, I'm aware of any study that say that uh, basal vein transposition has higher heart failure rate. You know that I know of. And uh, have you tried this uh, end to side uh, fistula using that vein and the retrograde mm -hmm. flow? I mean, a reverse fistula. R rather than anterior flow, we made it end to side retrograde flow so that it goes into the forearm and then the veins are matured. We find it that quite useful compared to basilic vein uh, transposition. I think that's a good point. Uh, I don't have much experience about reverse vein. Uh, you know, I'm yes. not sure. In fact, Dr. Rana can share his experience. Okay, <laughs> fine. We have made, we have, this is all our own innovations. Right. In fact, uh, we have made fistulas where we have used ulnar vein and then transposition of ulnar vein. And quite frequently we have made those fistulas. Sure. Might please, Mike. can you give, give the mic? First would be uh, radiocephalic, then brachiocephalic, and then uh, radio ulnar, you know. Ulnar vein, most of the time, never used by the people, especially cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. They always spare that, you know. And that in most of the people, they are the quite weird and mobilization and supervision of that vein is very easy. I th this should be the last choice uh, as a brachiocephalic uh, fistula you concern. Of course, it's certainly better than what saphenous vein, and I still think that it will be better than graft also. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, can we move on to the next presentation as we move on? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much.